I'd like certainly once again to reiterate my appreciation for the opportunity to be here, for the uh, invitation certainly to speak. I consider it an honor uh, to be get granted this privilege and just simply to be here. Uh, it's been a few years since I've been able to come to the lectures here, uh, and uh, you realize, especially when you come back and I see what you've missed, and uh, as mentioned during the prayer by Brother Townsend, it's good to... Good to see you in person. I believe, uh, if I'm right, I believe I had you for a student back at TBI a few years ago. An outstanding student, by the way, and so certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to see him finally, uh, see, see what he looks like. People look different uh, when you see him in person than uh, on email and things of that nature. Uh, we actually now, I'm doing my teaching on TBI. I've done it all now face to face over the internet, but he was before I started doing it uh, through that medium. Again, uh, appreciation is extended to the Spring Congregation for the lectureship that you're holding. Appreciate the good hospitality that has been granted by the, by the cones, um, taking care of the various issues. I enjoyed the cold shower this morning, but glad it was taken care of afterwards uh, because I would have had to deal with an angry wife if it hadn't been. So thank thankfully that was taken care of, and I've been pretty well fed too. So, And I know you have, and so try to keep your chin up. And we'll try to keep things lively and interesting, and certainly as we look towards God's Word, we know that there's something there in which we can delight. Now, what is the great desire of every Christian husband and father? Well, that desire should certainly be to see that his wife, that his children are all found faithful, that they come to obey the gospel, and that they remain faithful Christians throughout their entire life lives. That is their great desire. And it's certainly a worthy concern. We, we ought to be concerned about this. But now being concerned is all that some apparently seem to do. There's a lot of hand wringing that goes on about uh, when they see children that are taking steps that appear to be away from faithfulness. But yet husbands and fathers are not resigned to sit on the sidelines as spectators as their family runs or does not run the Christian race. Of Abraham, the father of the faithful, God said, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after them, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of. Him. Genesis 18 and 19. Wouldn't every Christian husband and father like the Lord have that same confidence in Him? I know Him. I know which direction He is going to lead His household. I know that ultimately they're going to keep the way of the Lord. I know that they're going to do justice and judgment. Wouldn't you like the Lord to have that same confidence in you, those of you who are husbands and fathers? Well, as it, we are then told what the Lord thought and knew about Abraham... We can see then that there is a certain responsibility then that is spoken of. Abraham had a responsibility to lead his household. And anyone who would be a husband and father today has a like responsibility to lead his household. The husband and father has been called the spiritual leader of the home. And there are leadership characteristics that each of us needs to possess if we're going to lead our family the way that we should, if we're going to fill our, fulfill our responsibility in keeping our family faithful. And so this afternoon, we will look at those essential or some of those essential leadership characteristics that need to be found in the husband and father that would lead his family in that direction. First of all, let's consider divinely appointed leadership. Uh, God is not the author of confusion, we're told in 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is a God of order. God sets forth leadership. And has, as has already been considered, God has set forth leadership in the church. The Holy Spirit made elders the overseers of the church, Acts 20 and verse 28, Hebrews 13, 7. God has appointed civil governments, to oversee society and to rule in that realm. And likewise, God has set forth a leadership structure within the home. 
And the father, the husband, is to be the head of the household. We read in Genesis 3.16 what God said to the woman. He said, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now that's not actually the first place where that began, where male leadership in the household began. That was actually the way it had been intended from the beginning. For what purpose did God make the woman? He said, I will make him and help meet for him. Genesis 2 and verse 17. The woman failed to meet her obligation within that leadership structure that God had set forth. And then we find it even intensified as spoken of in Genesis 3.16. Thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. But if there be any doubt about the matter, we can certainly find the matter legislated in the New Testament, in the Christian covenant. We read in Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Or as we read in uh, Colossians 3, 18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Or as we read in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I would have you know, that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now that doesn't mean that every man is the head of every woman, but within the home, certainly, the head of the woman is to be the man. We see the leadership structure that is set forth in the home, and we see the responsibility with which God has particularly entrusted fathers. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so again, the father is rightly called the spiritual leader of the home. Fathers are specifically told that. Now we look at our society today, and we certainly see the male leadership role within the home denigrated. We see really even leadership within the home denigrated as we look at what legislators are doing. We look at what judges are doing. Some of you might be familiar with the United Nations Conventions on the right, Convention on the Rights of a Child. This has been pushed by uh, Barbara Boxer. Uh, our fearless leader has said that it's an embarrassment that this hasn't been signed. And really what's called the Convention on the Rights of the Child will be better called Convention on the Non-Rights of the Parent. That is ultimately the desire is that if parents are not going to follow the wills of the state, then essentially those children can become a ward of the state. And we don't really have the time to go into that in depth, but we certainly see the God-ordained leadership structure denigrated. You look at the television shows that one finds on t TV today. Brother Brown mentioned the television show that existed in the 50s, Father Knows Best. Well, if they were to rename today's sitcoms with the father's role in place within the show is what would be called. Father knows squat. Father's a knucklehead. Father's a dope. That's what the common portrayal is. You look at, you know, Al Bundy, and that's the kind of model that you have now for the television father today. And then you look at how families are commonly structured then and how they operate. You don't see men having that leadership role that they are supposed to have. You'll pe hear people referring to, got to go ask the boss. Men will be asking that. Got to go ask the boss. They're talking about the wife. There are too many manly women who are seeking to usurp the God-given role that He has given to the man. And there are likewise too many measly men who are willing to relinquish that role that God has given to them. And so the name Father itself has been denigrated to ridicule. The name Father should conjure images of authority, especially when we consider what our Lord Jesus Christ calls the one above. Our Father, Matthew 6, 9. And he went on to say, And call no man your Father upon the earth, for one is your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 23, 9. And so there was the prohibition against giving such a designation to some type of religious leader. 
Now that wasn't to say that earthly fathers, physical fathers, should not or could not be called fathers, as we've noted in Ephesians 6 2 and Ephesians 6 4 and other places. We see the Bible calls them, yes, fathers. And so the fact that we, who are fathers, fleshly fathers, are privileged to share that title with the Heavenly Father should stress upon us all the more the heavy burden that we bear and that we have been given that divinely appointed leadership as God the Father is the ruler in His house. So those who are earthly fathers are the God-appointed leaders in their house. Let's consider then prioritized leadership. A good leader has definite goals that he seeks to attain, and he is going to make sure that peripheral matters do not interfere with obtaining those goals that he has set forth. A husband and father needs to establish the priorities of his home and make sure that spiritual matters come first in all things. In the book of Proverbs, it will speak about the priorities of home. It speaks about a wise man versus a foolish man, or as it's often called, a wise son versus a foolish son. We read, for example, in Proverbs 10.1, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Or Proverbs 17.21, He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. And we could go on with several other verses that speak about that in the book of Proverbs. But it speaks then about the shame, the sorrow that a foolish child brings to his household. But yet the glory that a wise son or wise daughter can bring to the household. But what's that mean? It speaks about a wise son. The terms wise and foolish are not used in the book of Proverbs the same way that they are in the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians. When it speaks against the things of the wise, those who would lift themselves up above others, the sophisticated, the sophists. No, that's not what's being spoken of. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Or as we read in Proverbs 9.1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And so what makes a son or daughter wise or foolish? His adherence to the word of the Lord. But yet so many, so many parents act as though the thing that brings shame or pride into their home is not whether or not their sons or daughters are faithful to the word of the Lord. They rarely act that way, that that's the primary source of pride or shame in their children. You might hear them say, well, my son received a scholarship to play baseball. Well, that's great. Going to college on full ride, wonderful. But has he obeyed the gospel yet? Or my daughter just graduated college with honors. Wonderful. Great. Glad to hear it. But has she remained faithful? Now, I talk with brethren, and they speak about their pride in their children and the pride of, about other children, and they're rank heathen. But they'll speak about the fact that, but this person is a doctor, and so we're so proud of them, but they're not faithful. Or this one is a, a movie star, but that person is not faithful. Should you really have that level of pride in that when they are not faithful? faithful? Do you really have then your priorities where they need to be? See, we're told that the commandments of the Lord are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They're not impossible to perform, 1 Corinthians 5.3. But yet faithfulness to the Lord is not an easy task. The world places countless impediments between children, between all of us, and our faithful obedience to the Lord. And some of them might be actual enticements to sin. We know how, this, how Satan is. He's a roaring lion going about seeking whom he, may, whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. But those aren't the only things that can cause impediments between faithful obedience. Mere distractions, 
worldly occasions, extracurricular activities, hobbies, any number of things can come between those things. And you find parents spending more and more time with these other things, children spending more and more time with these other things, families spending more and more time with these other things. Which is the main thing? What are the priorities in that home? How are you going to obtain faithfulness to the Lord when it's really not the priority in the home? And really, faithfulness to the Lord can only be attained where faithful service to the Lord is first priority. Christ said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. He did not leave it as an option to put it second or third or fourth. It's got to be first. The Apostle Paul said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I have not reached moral perfection. I have not received the final prize. I have not gotten there. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. It speaks about singularity of purpose. Focus. Focused in on this one thing. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. This is the mind that we need to have. The mind of Christ. That needs to be our focus. That needs to be our purpose. And steps need to be taken to prepare a faithful household even before that household is built. A young man who is looking toward the future and as he is considering perhaps a prospective wife needs to remember what is said in Proverbs 31 verse 30. Favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Uh, too many men, Christian men, are led astray because they find a woman who's not a Christian or certainly not a truly convicted Christian. And thus is to the detriment of the faithfulness of that family and the faithfulness of that home. Prayer needs to be part of that young man's life, praying for the future faithfulness of his children. A prayer that will continue certainly once that home is built. And a prayer that will continue long after those children have left home. Because it's the priority. That's the, what we need to have in the home. We need to have prioritized leadership. And there also needs to be attentive leadership. Leadership is more than a title. Some people wear that, you know, any other type of leadership, they're just excited to get it because then they get to wear a title proudly. But it's so much more. Where there is leadership... There is responsibility. And where there is responsibility, there must of necessity be attentiveness. Those who work at a control tower at an airport, they have responsibility. Far exceeding somebody who is sitting at home and on the couch watching the Weather Channel on TV. You know, if that person watching the Weather Channel on TV gets up, goes and fixes himself a little meal, and then wanders off, forgets the, even that he had the TV on. That's not that terrible a thing. But the one who is operating at the control tower gets up and does the same thing. That's serious neglect and very dangerous. There needs to be attentiveness. We read in Romans 12.8, it says, He that ruleth is to do it with diligence. Uh, that word for ruler speaks about one who is the head over. Just like the husband and father is given. And so we have then to have diligence. <clears throat> and that requires then time. requires attention. It requires watchfulness. You know, father, fatherly neglect lies at the root of many of society's problems. Where there is no father. You look at what the statistics show and you'll find that there are far greater behavioral problems, far greater social problems, far more likely to be in trouble with the law, do far worse in school where there is no father. And so you look you know, at the things that have happened in society. You look at the rise of divorce. You look at the spike in the number of children born out of wedlock. And you can say, 
You know, we have a lot of social problems, and the lack of fathers in the home has a lot to do with it. As a matter of fact, a study done by the McGill University Health Center has shown that children actually have a change in their brain structure where no father is present, which certainly can continue and compound what we've noted with regard to the behavioral and other problems. But not only is it the case when there is the actual physical absence of a father is their problem, but sometimes a father can even be physically present in the home, but yet otherwise, in many respects, absent. We find in many cases in Scripture the Lord referring and comparing the work of leadership to that work of a shepherd. And you can understand why. A shepherd needs to be attentive to his flock. A shepherd needs to watch over them and care for them, and otherwise they'd be left to various perils of weather and of predators and things of that nature. And we read in Ezekiel 34, verses 4 through 6, about the failure of some of the shepherds of Israel. We see the Lord saying, The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought back that which has gone astray, neither have you sought that which was lost. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep they said they went abroad, they went upon every mountain, upon every high hill, and none did search or seek after them. No care. No attentiveness for the flock. And you look at the children of America today, and you see a flock that's scattered. You see the sheep without a shepherd. And so if we are to meet our responsibilities, we certainly need to be attentive. And attentiveness begins with simply spending time with our families and lots of them. There has been a, a, a saying that's come out you know, recently, you know, that, you know, and it's kind of related to the idea of divorce. And so you know, there's these custody issues. And they say, well, it doesn't matter about quantity of time as long as you spend quality Time. And I, Brother Summers, I think I first met, heard you mention this back in the 90s. But no, it's important that there is quantity of time as well. And what is this quality time? They'll typically refer to that as such things like going out to an amusement park, going out to Chuck E. Cheese, going out to a movie, where there's really not that much real discussion going on between the family. Nothing wrong with a family going to an amusement park or things of that nature. That's wonderful. That's great. But, you know, maybe two hours spent sitting around the dinner table after supper. That can be far more productive than an entire day spent at the amusement park. You know, it's sad that there are children who leave their homes with spiritual mal maladies that have never been diagnosed and certainly have never been addressed when simply if the fathers had spent more time with those children that have seen the problems and been better able to address those problems. But when we speak about spending time with family, we certainly don't mean that one, a father is only to be attentive towards his children. He certainly needs to be attentive toward his wife as well, the other half of his one flesh. In Ephesians 5, 28, which speaks about the husbands love your wives that have been mentioned in verse 25. It speaks about nourishing and cherishing that woman, even as the Lord does the church. We read in Proverbs 18, 22, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And so the Lord has blessed a man with a wife, and particularly with certain a certain kind of wife. We're told in Proverbs 12, 4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. Or as we read in Proverbs 19 and verse 14, it speaks about, again, what a, again, a, a prudent woman can be. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. 
And so a wife is a blessing from the Lord. Likewise, children. As we read in Psalm 127 and verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. And so, children, wife, a blessing from the Lord. Also a stewardship of the Lord as well. And it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. And so we need to be attentive to that stewardship with which we have been entrusted. We are going to need to be attentive to our family members. And that's going to require a large sacrifice of free time and me time. There needs to be attentive leadership. But not only does there need to be attentive, there also needs to be instructive leadership. Again, a, a shepherd will watch over his flock and be attentive to their needs. And one of the things that he is going to be sure to do for that flock is to lead them to where there is pasture, where they can be fed. We read in Matthew 4.4 4 what Jesus Christ said when the tempter was trying to get him to put focus on material matters rather than on the spiritual. He quoted Deuteronomy 8 and 3 saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. That's the place of feeding. That's the place to which a husband and father needs to lead his family. Fatherly neglect is a problem, as we've certainly mentioned. You think about a father who would fail to feed his children. What could happen? You, know, shutting, you hear about this occasionally. A father who will shut up his children in their room or in a closet and won't feed them. Well, he'd be convicted of criminal neglect. And likewise, a father who fails to see that his children are spiritually fed could in a sense be called guilty of neglect that is in a sense criminal. God has always charged parents with filling the next generation with His Word. In Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and following, the Lord said, and These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest out, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Everywhere, your home, your life, everywhere anyone associated with your family goes, they are hearing and seeing the Word of God. That's something that needs to be happening. That's something that needs to be taking place. That's what Moses commanded the Israelites shortly before the Israelites went over to take the promised land. Joshua led them in. They did take the promised land. We're told then, and after that generation, after they were all passed away, there arose another generation which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which He had done for Israel. Judges 2.10. Wait, another generation arose that knew not the Lord. Now certainly those parents had been teaching the Word of God the way that Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 instructed, hadn't they? Apparently not. In later generations, it would be said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest of thee, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Hosea 4, 6. Lack of knowledge. We can certainly see a similar crisis in the church today and there is plenty of blame to go around for that lack of knowledge that has allowed the liberalism to rise as Brother McClish noted in the last hour. Lack of knowledge. And so you can blame you know, weak preachers who fail to preach the whole counsel of God, spineless elders who fail to insist that the flock be fed as they should and fail to stop the mouths of fat, false teachers. You could blame lazy Bible class teachers who failed to really prepare their classes and to fill those children up with the Word of God. But there's also blame to be laid at the feet of parents. Parents and particularly fathers who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders in their homes. We have 
so many within the church who have entrusted the spiritual rearing of their children to somebody else. Ephesians 6.4 does not say youth ministers bring up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers. Fathers are given that specific responsibility. They are to do that. They are to teach them. We need to teach the children what the Bible says. They need to know the most basic facts and go beyond that. Allow them to think spiritually. You know, a good leader does not seek to create a cult of mindless drones. And a father who is seeking to rear children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord will want them to be able to reason critically, to be able to reason from a spiritual perspective, to be able to, as we read in 1 Peter 3.15, be able always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And likewise, fathers and husbands should be prepared to give their family members those answers. Now sometimes, because I said so, might be the right answer to a child. That in itself is a lesson in authority. But husbands and fathers should view a question when they ask why, view it as a teaching opportunity. They ask the question, well, here's your chance to give them an answer. So many times they don't seem to listen. Well, here's your chance. Instruct them, teach them, teach them what how we can give that defense. Children need to learn Christian evidences and other apologetics. There needs to be instructive leadership taking place in the home. And there needs to be firm leadership. A firm, a, a good leader has a clear vision of where he wants to go and is resolute and determined to arrive at that goal. He is firm in that. Joshua said to the Israelites, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord your God, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood that is on the other side of the Euphrates River, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He was firm in that. It could be said of him, much had been said about Abraham 500 years earlier. I know him. I know he will command his children in his household after him. I know that they will do, keep the way of the Lord. I know that they will do justice and judgment. There is that firm leadership. We see it in Abraham. We see it in Joshua. And it's needed now more than ever today. But we don't see it today. Not like we need to. If you look at the, some of the changes in language... There are sometimes signs of the times, markers of changes in our culture. And Reader's Digest, for example, has a, each month has a, a new word, a new word that has entered into the English, English language. And back in October, their word was peer ending. And this is uh, what's sometimes also called negotiation parenting. Uh, this is favored by the generation of parents that is arising today, the group that's called the Millennials. And uh, uh, one father said, I negotiate daily with my son who is 13. And so there's negotiation. There is a, they're peers. They're on the same level. And so everything is negotiated. Well, there might be a time and a place for that. But to practice true parenting, that fails to observe the God-given delineation that needs to exist in the home. In 1 Peter 3, verses 4 and 6, as it speaks about the qualification, qualifications of elders. It speaks about how they are to have the rule of their children. They are to have faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And so he needs to have the rule in his house. Now, not all men are going to become elders. But that's certainly the desire that God would have for every home, that they rule well their own house. God said of Eli as he spoke to Samuel, he said, For I've told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. What's Eli been guilty of? Stealing? Murder? Adultery? Well, it's because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Does that mean he didn't say anything whatsoever to them? 
We read in 1 Samuel 2, verses 22 and following, Now Eli was very old, and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil doing, dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the Lord shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not to the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. And so, Eli certainly said something, uh, but he didn't say, he didn't do enough. His restraint was apparently not forceful enough. And so there needs to be a certain firmness, a certain for forcefulness of the correction that needs to take place in the home. And there needs to be, for example, there needs to be corporal punishment in a home. We read in Proverbs 23, verses 13 and 14, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with a rod, shalt deliver his soul from hell. That is the Hebrew Sheol, the abode of the dead. You can save him from destruction with that punishment. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. So that's the loving thing to do. To exercise corporal punishment when needed, and to do so betimes or promptly to do it quickly. And so there needs to be firm leadership. They need to learn authority and respect for authority in the home. Paul would use the application in Hebrews 12, 9, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. It says children learn that respect for authority in the home, that they can learn how to function in society with respect for authority and ultimately with respect for God. But not only does there need to be firm leadership, there also needs to be Gentle leadership. The Apostle Paul said, Now I myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Now he could have said, I command you by the authority of Christ. But he said, I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He said, We were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her children. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. Elders are told that they are not to lord it over God's heritage. 1 Peter 5 and verse 3. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower knew a thing or two about leadership. And he made this statement. He said, pull the string and it will follow wherever you wish. Push it and it will go nowhere at all. There needs to be that gentleness in the home as well as that firmness. And Paul was certainly capable of showing either. And a good leader is not a tyrant. A good husband and his father does not simply seek to impose his personal will on the fam rest of the family at all times. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them. That is, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. This is a joint effort. She is your partner. Yes, you have the leadership. Yes, you have the headship. But at the same time, you've been blessed with someone who has wisdom. Consult that wisdom. Respect her wishes. Show gentleness toward her and toward the family. Certainly abuse has no place within the Christian home. Rather, a home needs to show the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. According to Romans 2 and verse 4, we're told that the goodness and forbearance and long-suffering of God leads people to repentance. Likewise, as children can see those attributes in their father, it can likewise lead them to faithfulness. But there needs to be gentle leadership. There also needs to be <clears throat> vigilant leadership. In Job 1.5, we're told about the vigilance of Job as his children were celebrating each other's birthdays in each other's houses. Each morning, early, he took them and they would offer a sacrifice. Why? He said, it may be that they have cursed God in their hearts. It might be that they've done this sin. He didn't know that they had, but he knew about the possibilities that existed in times of celebration. And so he was vigilant. And as Hebrews 12, 15 says, we need to be looking diligently, lest any man fail, especially lest any family member fail, of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And so we need to be vigilant. The husbands and fathers need to be vigilant with regard to bad friends. He that walketh with 
wise men. And we talked about wise and foolish in Proverbs, didn't we? He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 13, 20. In Psalm 119, verse 63, it says, I'm a companion of all of them that fear thee, and of them that keep thy precepts. Get to know that, your children's friends. Get to know what they're like. And sometimes a friend who can show such a sweet smile at the door can be an entirely different person once he's outside. So many times, parents, Christian parents allow their children to go to the homes of friends where they are poorly influenced either by those friends themselves or even by their parents. But there needs to be vigilance with regard to these things, with regard to the entertainment media, with regard to secular humanism, and all these avenues that Satan might use. And there needs to be exemplary leadership. Well, our time has come to an end. But we, who are husbands and fathers, have a great potential to lead a family to faithfulness. We have a responsibility to lead a family to faithfulness. And maybe it can be said of us the same thing that was said of faithful Abraham. While none of us will ever be able to be called the father of the faithful as Abraham was, yet can be said of us that we led a family to faithfulness.